Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Trust that our broadcast here on World Harvest Television has been a blessing to you. And uh, as we promised to you last week, as we were looking at the prophetic impact of North Korea, I said I'd come back and take a look more at Daniel's prophecies here, starting, uh, of course, chapter 11, verse 39, moving down again to verse 44. And before we do that, let's take a little recap of what we were looking at last week there. We were talking about North Korea, how that China and Russia's involvement in North Korea may very well be fulfilling prophecy that is found in Daniel 11, verse 44. Uh, war games have been happening there in South Korea as well as North Korea. Kim Jong-un, definitely an unstable man there with his finger on a powerful nuclear weapons inside of his country that he is gaining more and more knowledge to be able to deliver those pretty much anywhere in the world he would like to do so. And therefore, President Trump very much is concerned about what's happening and what may need to be done to stop President Kim Jong-un from doing the unthinkable. And of course, when we look at this from a prophetic standpoint, we know that China, first moving into Dongfeng 41 last year, up into the northeast region of, the, uh, of their country there, just north of North Korea's border, had moved in a nuclear warhead system, 10 nuclear warheads per ballistic missile that the Dongfeng 41 carries. It is certainly a major concern, not only for, uh, well, actually more for the United States than it is for anyone else, because how would China ever use this on North Korea? As some have thought, perhaps that and the 150,000 troops that uh, China moved to the North Korean border, also the S-300 advanced system that they bought from Russia has been moved to this region, makeshift hospitals have been put up, and even they have put their forces on high alert. Some have speculated that it's because China is about done with North Korea and getting ready to take them down. But then there's others, like myself, that believe that China will protect North Korea based on their 1961 friendship treaty agreement that they made. Time will only tell. But then Russia moved into the territory as well. On North Korea's northern border, they share a, a small strip of land with the north there. They moved in the bulk M uh, anti-air uh, defense missile system. Russia later moved in tanks, soldiers, S-300, S-400 to the far east there, and has warned the United States to think twice before targeting North Korea. Because as Russia says, it will cause a nuclear fallout in their country if they were to do any type of strike on North Korea, which would be a devastation, devastating blow for Russia. And that's when I began to look at the prophecies in Daniel 11, verse 44. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. I know many scholars were beginning to think that when Russia first come down to Syria and China also being supportive of President Bashar al-Assad, that this may be the beginning of those prophecies being fulfilled in Daniel chapter 11, verse 44. But to me, it didn't make sense because east was first and then north. Whereas Russia came first to Syria, then China talked about backing them up. But we never seen China move a large military contingency to Syria as we did Russia. But on the other hand, North Korea seemed to set the stage for the prophecy of Daniel 1144. Not saying that North Korea is the king of the north by no means. And I think after this broadcast, you might have a better idea just exactly who the king of the north is. And no doubt you'll know who the king of the south is. Let's continue on. In Daniel 11, 44, Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and to utterly make away many. Okay, now we begin to back up and we go to Syria. Let's take a look at what's going on in Syria again. As we started off our uh, broadcast here on World Harvest Television Network, we were talking about Damascus and the prophecy of Damascus in Isaiah chapter 17 and how the U.S. may play a lead role and the demise of Damascus, taking down of President Bashar al-Assad, something that not only President Trump has talked about doing, but even President Barack Obama has also talked about taking this leader down. All of them have demonized him to no end. And yet there have been many Americans, leaders, Peace Corps movement, as well as 
uh, politicians that have sided with President Bashar al-Assad and said he's not as evil as the world is making him out to be. But nonetheless, it seems that prophecy is on course to be fulfilled. And in the latest things that have been happening, as we've shared with you already here on Israeli News Live, both here on World Harvest Television Network and as well as our daily broadcasts that are done on YouTube each day, Israeli News Live, covering those events that are happening in the Middle East, also the European theater and Ukraine conflict, as well as North Korea. But now Russia has moved their own special forces. According to LevantTimes.com on May the 21st, they moved their special forces to southern Syria after the U.S. had done a strike on an army convoy, a Syrian army convoy near Al-Tanf. Al-Tanf, Syria, by the way, is located just uh, to the north of Syria, excuse me, of Iraq and the Jordanian borders there. Al-Tanf is right there on the southern border of Syria, right there to the north northeastern border of Jordan and southwest corner of Iraq, or northwest corner of Iraq, the far part there, as you can see on your map, all these little areas coming together. And as we reported before on Israeli News Live on YouTube, Norwegian special forces have joined U.S. and British forces, Free Syrian Army and Jordanian forces there, as the President Trump is trying to carve out his envisioned idea for Syria, the safe zones. But I believe that the safe zones are what's going to ignite or be the flashpoint that's going to ignite a war with not only taking down uh, Bashar al-Assad in Damascus to justify that, but as well as to take down the Iranian country as well, something that uh, we have been seeing that is coming, no doubt, for some time. Let's take a look, though, at the prophecy. Let's back up. Let's take a look at Daniel chapter 11, verse 39, and I'll go into these things as I promised that I would do with you guys. Okay, thus shall he do it in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. Now, Sometimes prophecies, when we look at them, although it's one verse to another, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, you would think that it would be chronologically back-to-back -back events that happen, but not always. In the case here, Daniel chapter 11, verse 39, I believe backs all the way up to 1914. And of course, going all the way down to verse 44, the, the, the sequence of events will bring us all the way to modern times here in 2017. A huge timeline that, that, is, uh, that has transpired. And as well, some people would argue that, well, these prophecies are already being fulfilled. You're just a futurist when you're talking about these things. Well, remember, prophecies often carry compound fulfillments, compound revelations. Like, for example, out of Egypt I call my son. Well, most Jewish people know that that reverse refers to Israel coming out of bondage 400 years under the Egyptian rule and the Jewish people going to the homeland. But also we notice from the Christian apostles that were with Jesus that it referred to Jesus himself as well. Out of Egypt, I called my son. When he goes down into Egypt while he's escaping Herod's sword and is brought back later. So it's a compound fulfillment. And I see this often in scriptures, seeing this being fulfilled. Now, as we look uh, at the map here, we see this is when 1914, when the onset of the, uh, of the war broke out, we had the Ottoman Empire. And in the First World War, the British and the French went down to that Middle East area there and they overthrew the Ottoman Empire. But it was ironic that at the exact same time, that the Vatican had reestablished their relationships or their relationship with the British Empire. Something that was, uh, that was a strong relationship with the British Empire uh, under, during the Middle Ages all the way to the 16th century until the Protestant Reformation. And then the relationships between the Vatican and the British Empire had been broken. And it stayed broken for, well, 200 years or more till 1914 at the onset of the First World War when the Vatican and the British Empire reestablished their relationship. And of course, I believe this may be where we're seeing a prophecy being fulfilled in Daniel 11 verse 39. 
We read in King James Version, a strange God, thus shall he do for the, mo for the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. In the Hebrew language, though, it's not a strange God. It's a foreign God. And it's not just a land like the Aretz, which is referred to as Israel often, but it's Adama, which literally is, he, they shall divide the earth for gain. I know many people could probably think at this point here, uh, imagine or envision a new world order. Some call for a new world order without borders, but nonetheless, the world would be divided up into ten regions. I think, though, it all began, though, back in World War I, when we actually saw, after the British and French mandates divided up the Ottoman Empire into different countries, Syria, Iraq, Transjordan, and Israel. The British mandate covered Israel as well as the Iraqi territories. And what was interesting under the British mandate, there was a Jewish homeland back in 1920 that included both Transjordan and the modern day Israel today as one country for a Jewish homeland. But after a couple of years of wrangling back and forth, they decided, the British Empire decided that they should reward, reward those uh, fighters in the Middle East there, the Arab fighters, and they gave what is called Transjordan to King Abdullah's, uh, or King Hussein's son, King Abdullah, as a reward for helping in the battle to overthrow the Ottoman Empire. And that's how the land first got divided there. Not to mention the entire Ottoman Empire was being divided. The French got, the Syri got Syria and Lebanon. They divided that up. They actually had taken control of a lot of part of what is called modern day Turkey as well. But they relinquished that back over. And the British, though, they created the state of Iraq, and of course now the country of Jordan, Israel, and once again being divided even again the state of Israel. But that's something we'll get into a bit later when we look at Joel's prophecy. But what caught my attention about all this was the very map that the president put out on his White House, or on, the, on the White House website when he was getting ready to do his first trip abroad, going over to Saudi Arabia, Israel, on over to see the Pope of Rome, then to the G7 summit, or actually I think it was Brussels, then to G7 summit, and then back home again. But what did not escape most people's eyes was the fact that the Golan Heights was removed from the map of Israel. Now we've already discussed this with you guys before, so I won't go too deep into that right now, but that definitely did catch our eyes. And that is what is fulfilling the prophecy of Joel chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Let's take a look at those. For behold, in those days, and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations, and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Now, in that case there, the part of the land is not Adama, the earth, but Atsi. My land in Hebrew is what Atsi means, or Atz, the land of Israel. So the dividing of the land inside of Israel is a little different from the dividing of the land or the earth, Adama, that we find in Daniel's prophecy, and therefore with different fulfillments. Now, I actually reported about this all the way back in 2013, not just at that point there, but a specific article that came out. Now, the article I have on the screen is from uh, Stephanie Condon on CBS News. Kerry sets a nine-month goal for Mideast peace talks. But he actually announced this early in July. And so on July the 23rd of 2013, the Lord had revealed to me a remarkable revelation about Kerry's nine-month negotiation. A revelation that had everything to do with the story of Rebecca and the two children inside of her womb. And there's been many prophecy teachers that have picked up the revelation that I've had and have shared that on their own channels as well. And perhaps maybe you never knew where it actually come from. But right after John and Kerry announced that nine-month negotiations, I knew then that it was referring to the prophecy of Rebecca. Remember the story of Rebecca? And I'll just paraphrase that for now, where she has the children in her womb, she has twins in her wombs, and they're struggling, they're fighting with one another. 
And Rebecca goes before the Lord and she says, why am I thus? Why is this happening to me? And the Lord says to Rebecca, there are two nations in thy womb and two manners of people. And when they come forth, they shall be separated. And the Lord put on my heart, this is exactly what is happening to Israel. There are two nations in thy womb, Esau and Jacob. And when they come forth, they will be separated. And the fact that John Kerry said that there was a nine-month negotiation only strengthened that itself, showing that a child forms nine months inside the womb. Now, most people have their eyes on the fact of a Palestinian state and a Jewish state the state of Israel, and that they would be divided and create two states. But in reality, it's much deeper than that. Because Esau, according to Jewish uh, scholars, is modern-day Rome. The people that live in the land of Italy is where the Roman Empire actually goes to, or the descendants of Esau. And biblically, I've done many teachings on this, this is actually true. And while the Oslo Accords were going on, this was as reported by the late Joel Bainerman, the Israeli journalist said that this was the red herring, if you were. That all the while, the negotiations that were there for dividing the land was all about Rome. Now Daniel does speak about how that uh, the prince that shall come, as it speaks of in Daniel chapter 9, comes up strong with a small people. And I believe that that was the Palestinian people because Rome is more interested in Jerusalem. And don't forget, 1947, the British mandate was all about Jerusalem becoming an international city. The 1948 Independence War kind of changed that, and the 1967 war even more so changed that, and kind of slowed that progress down of the Resolution 181 of 1947. But Rome has never forgotten about it, and Rome still wants to control Jerusalem. This is why... East Jerusalem will go to the Palestinians. West Jerusalem will be a capital for Israel. That will not change. And there's more prophecies, all kinds of prophecies about this I'd love to share with you. We just have to save it for another time because I'll lose track of time. But nonetheless, when Rebecca spoke those words, it was prophetic because there were two nations in her womb, two manners of people. And the Romans or the Vatican today and Israel are two different peoples and the land will be divided for that very reason it has a lot to do with so many things gosh I, I, I wish we had the time to go into more on this but I know our time is short won't be long we'll be finished with all this let's go into Daniel chapter 11 verse 40 now this is a powerful powerful prophecy that I've just got to share with you as well all right and this one here, and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Now, I believe we shared with you already before, as we have it highlighted in yellow here, and he shall enter into the countries. That's plural. So Daniel 11 verse 39 when World War I breaks out, that's just the beginning. That's not chapter 40. That's only the beginning of it. That's when the British, the British and the French go down in World War I and overthrow the Ottoman Empire and the land begins to be divided for gain or the earth is divided for gain. When we get to chapter 40, time has passed on by many, many years. And in Hebrew... It doesn't say the king of the south, south shall push at him, but it literally says with him in Hebrew. As you can see on your screen, Imo Melech Hanegev. Okay, Imo Melech Hanegev. Imo is with him. And the king of the south is not, is actually the word Hanegev or the Negev desert, which is Israel. So the king of the south is an Israeli leader. Now, I can't say specifically that Prime Minister Netanyahu is that actual king, although he's the first prime minister that was ever elected back in 1996 that, is regarded, that was regarded by the people as the king of Israel. All right? But it's actually, he's not being pushing at him, but he's pushing with him. So the king of the north and this king of the south 
which I happen to believe that the king of the north is the one that is, we would say, over the NATO forces. Because the British Empire is, is basically, it's not just Britain, but it's NATO. It's the French, it's the Europeans, it's, the, it's all those that are part of this group that have been battling through the Middle East together ever since the Iraq war. All right? So he pushes at him or with him. He's pushing with him. What? He's pushing with him to deal with the enemies that he has inside the Middle East, especially that of Iran. Then, of course, Israel considers Syria an enemy as well because of the wars that they have fought with them before President Bashar al-Assad got in. But I still believe, as I said to you in our first broadcast on Hebrew, uh, excuse me, on World Harvest Television Network here, that under President Bashar al-Assad, that when Damascus falls, that the fortress for Ephraim, for the Christians living in Syria, that that will also fall with it because they'll allow a renegade group to get control of this land. It's not going to be good, guys. It's not. It really isn't. Let's move on. Now, here's what's interesting. This was on the cover of Time magazine in 2012. But in 1996, when Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was the youngest ever uh, politician to be elected as Prime Minister of Israel, they ran through the streets crying, Bibi or, or Benny, King of the Jews. And I'll never forget, I was in Destin, Florida, young man at the time, and there was an Israeli woman there staying at a hotel. I was delivering a piano there, and when I was delivering the piano, I met her children, very nice children, and they wanted to introduce me to her, their parents because they spoke Hebrew, so I understood what they were saying. And I, when I met this lady, I said, isn't it interesting? Don't even know why I even said it. Just come out of me, the Spirit of God moving upon me. I said to her, I said, you know, isn't it, I said, wasn't it wonderful that, uh, Bibi got elected as the prime minister. She said, oh yes, it's wonderful because everyone expected that you know he would put a stop to a two-state solution, we'd have one state. But what happened? I told her, I said, do you realize it'll never work? And she said, what are you talking about? It'll never work. I said, because we have to recognize as a Jewish people where we left God. I said, and we are actually on our road home back to God right now. I said, and it starts with Prime Minister being elected as a king of Israel, so to speak, which was ironic because Mike Evans had anointed him many years before this and prophesied over him that he would be Prime Minister of Israel not once but twice. And you don't anoint a man as a Prime Minister, you anoint him as a king. And I believe it was symbolic, <laughs> prophetically, showing that the Scripture would be fulfilled. But there again, I don't say that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is the king of the South per se. It is an Israeli leader, but it is interesting how he's referred to as a king. And as I said to the sister, where did we leave God? I said, we left God when we wanted a king to rule over us. And we left Samuel the prophet, God's choice for leading our people. And then what happened? I said, we got a good king. We got a David. We got Solomon. But then we got a bunch of roustabouts. That's how we ended up bringing Jezebel into our country. And then finally in 70 AD, we were dispersed, our city was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, and we were dispersed to all the four corners of the earth. And this is where we're at now. I said, but what are we at? We're on the, I said, God brings you back the same way you leave him is the way you, way you go back. Now we've gotten a prime minister in 1996, and now currently here in 2017, Prime Minister Netanyahu, and the people have looked at him as being a king, and as good of a man as he is, I said, it'll never work. Even Micah's prophecy in chapter 4, God asked the question, is there no king in thee? What will we do? We will cry out for Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu, to be sent back according to Malachi's prophecy in chapter 4. And that's what we're going to see. That's what we're about to see being fulfilled here in modern days. But Moses will come with him. And by the way, next our next broadcast, I've got to go into the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah. And I know there's different opinions on that. Some believe it's Enoch. I'm not against you at all, my brother, sister, if that's the way you feel on that. I do believe it's Moses. And I'm going to share some powerful insights with you on this right here. So I know it's two different schools of thought. And I know that they say because uh, Enoch never died and Elijah never died and they they both must die. So we're going to go into that next week. But let's, let's kind of move on, try to finish this up. Daniel 11, chapter 41 and 42 here. And he shall enter also in the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief children of Ammon. As I said last week, the chief children of Ammon is the Jordanians, the, the, the Palestinians, and of course, Edom is Rome. 
So they're not going to be destroyed as this battle goes through there. And he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. And isn't it fascinating? All right, now we can go all the way back. What began this? CNN reporting, uh, uh, breaking news, America under attack, Israeli Prime Minister, Foreign Minister off, offers condolences to the American people. This was on September the 11th, 2001, right? We know about the Twin Towers and how they fell and the things that happened there. And then, of course, President Bush, he declares a war on terror. He shall, what? Verse 41, Daniel 11, he shall enter also into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown. Remember what General Wesley Clark said years ago? We're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off with Iran. He was a whistleblower. The general gave away what the plans were. And as a guy told him, he says, you know, everything, if you got a good hammer, every, everything must look like a nail. But what was interesting was he doesn't, doesn't mention Egypt in there. But we do know that these countries, we've seen Iraq go down, Lebanon not as of yet, but it's in turmoil because of what? Well, because of Hezbollah. And the U.S. has moved all their military equipment in there for Damascus. Don't think they're not going to take out Hezbollah as well because Hezbollah is an enemy, not only of Israel, but of the U.S. as well. Libya is totally in turmoil. Somalia, Sudan, and Iran is definitely the next target. But remember what it says in verse 42. And he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, plural, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Powerful how the prophecy reads. And the land of Egypt shall not escape. And it doesn't. U.S. back coop hijacks revolution. Foreign Policy Journal brings this out July 5th, 2013. And still... After, after, even all the way back to the time of, of Hillary Clinton, Libya, excuse me, Egypt has been in turmoil ever since then, as well as Libya, not just Egypt. I know we're coming down to the very end, guys, try to quickly finish this off. Verse 43, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold, of, over, of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Even the Ethiopia declares a state of emergency over the protest. Uh, government declares a state of emergency effective immediately following violence and unrest in the Oromia region. Now this, of course, is an older article of 2016 in October the 9th on Al Jazeera, but it's but all these areas here, Ethiopia, Libya, all of this is in turmoil. They're just slowly but surely overthrowing everything. And so here we are, Daniel 11:44. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy it and utterly make away many. Flashpoint is North Korea. Shalom. God bless you.